I think, growing thirst for spirituality, for some kind of sense that beyond the amazing structure of time and space and causality and the world and the beauty of the universe, there must be something going on there because it's just too amazing. <laughs> Dr. Tim Winter, thank you so much for honoring us. Assalamu alaikum. alaikum thank salam. you so much for honoring us and blessing us with your presence. Sheikh, you're doing amazing things uh, for humanity at large and specifically for the Muslim community in the UK. And you established the first uh, British Muslim college. We're calling it the Cambridge, um, Cambridge Muslim, Muslim College. Cambridge yeah. Muslim College. Why do you think there was a pressing need to establish the college? Yeah, in a sense, uh, the story of British Islam, even though there's uh, traces of Islam going back hundreds of years in England, it's a relatively new uh, but enormous transformation in, in the country's religious history. Probably the biggest thing that we've had since the Reformation, I guess, is the appearance of a Muslim community that's maybe three million strong now. And the recent census returns indicate that Muslims grew by 60% just in the last 10 years in the UK. And the first generation, they came and, mashallah, they worked hard, they saved hard, they created an infrastructure of, of the masajid, of the mosques. But I think there's a, an awareness amongst the younger generation and the outside world to some extent that even more important than the bricks and mortar and keeping the Muslims out of the yeah. rain, there is the question of what is being heard from the minbar. Mm -hmm. Because so many young Muslims are in a state of confusion, they've got questions, they have been agitated, sometimes stimulated by what they've heard at school, from the mass media, from thinkers, from what is still yes. an intellectually rigorous Western civilization where religion is not really allowed to be a comfort zone, but everybody's being probed and, and, and challenged. So they come to the masjid with a lot more questions than say their parents did. And it's essential that we use that unique experience and opportunity of the Juma and the aid prayer, when thousands and thousands of people who normally wouldn't be listening to religious messages much are actually there paying attention, hopefully for half an hour or so, to use that half an hour actually to give people answers to the questions that they're asking, rather than just to recycle traditional responses to their parents' and grandparents' world. So uh, it seems to me that the most important task for us living as Muslims in the somewhat precarious the frontline environment of living as new minorities in a Western world that often is rather unsure about us, is to uh, generate a religious discourse that is absolutely 100% uh, committed to and faithful to the, the legacy of classical uh, Islamic scholarship, but at the same time actually succeeds in uh, satisfying the quest that the young people have for questions, for uh, answers for new questions. Uh, very often people leave the Jumu'ah prayer unsatisfied or with the sense that they've just done their duty. It's like going to the dentist almost, you have to do it, but it's not really much fun. What we want is to re-establish the minbar as what it was in the time of the Holy Prophet, Ali yes. Salat, so like people coming in from distant places and they didn't know much about God and they had their own ancestral problems and forms of ignorance where the masjid and the minbar was a place of healing and everybody wanted to be there and the words of the Holy Prophet were falling on them like rain in the desert. And we want to restore that. So that means uh, revivifying Islamic scholarship. So what we do at the Cambridge Muslim College is we have a one-year diploma program. We take the best of the graduates of the Sharia seminaries and the Darul Alums. Uh, they're almost all people who are second-generation UK Muslims. And we give them a kind of upgrade in their skills so that they actually know about uh, the Big Bang, they know about the problem of evolution, they know about other religions, they've listened to the bishop, they've listened to the rabbi, yes. they, they know what created the modern world in which, which they inhabit. So uh, the result is after a year, they end up much more confident in themselves as young Muslim men and women, because they understand the world that they're looking at. They say, wow. that's a Methodist church, I know what that is. And that's a program about the dinosaurs, and I understand that. And the, this guy is whatever. And so they actually feel, not that they're assimilated into modernity, but at least they can understand it. Yeah. And with that sense of greater confidence, they can actually answer the questions that the younger people are putting to religion. And this is something that has to be done because we're facing a kind of ideological emergency at the moment, with the Olamat saying one thing, 
being nurtured from a, a different world, and the young people increasingly inhabiting a Western space, being very troubled. Uh, and so we're creating a new generation of scholars, of ulama, of muftis, of Muslim leaders, who are authentically rooted in the past, but at the same time, actually are saying things that make sense to the new generation. Do you think that the modern world is inherently um, hateful towards religion in general? The modern world is not a single thing. In Britain, we have a, a Christian constitution. The head of state has to be the head of the established church. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, most people never set foot in a church unless they go to their daughter's wedding. But otherwise, it's a very secular place. Uh, in that very diverse and fluid and rapidly changing world, yeah. there are two things happening. On the one hand, a lot of people are repelled by what religious extremists and fundamentalists are doing around the world. Not just in the Muslim world, but Hindu nationalists and the religious yes. right in America and settlers on the West Bank. And there's a sense that religion is fouling its nest and making itself kind of repulsive to, to, to decent ethical people. So there's a kind of pushback against religion. But at the same time, people are living such flat, materialistic lives that the human soul naturally craves meaning, a basis for morality, a hope about life after death. It's kind of hardwired. Maybe there's even a God gene. There's something in the human brain, the human soul, that really wants to believe and wants to know what it's all about and finds life infinitely richer when it has a meaning. So we have these two things uncomfortably coexisting in modern Britain. So it's not anti-religion, it's anti sort of brutal religion, certainly. It's anti-xenophobic religion as true religion is anyway. Uh, but at the same time, there is this, I think, growing thirst for spirituality, for some kind of sense that beyond the amazing structure of time and space and causality and the world and the beauty of the universe, there must be something going on there because it's just too amazing. And most people are asking that question and not really finding adequate answers. What are your thoughts on elitism? There has to be an elite insofar as there have to be people who are the best at doing certain things. Yes. So there have to be an elite of scholars who know tafsir better than the rest of us. Yes. There has to be an elite of Arabic or Farsi grammarians. So it's, it's necessary that there be an elite. But that's not the same as elitism. Yes, whereby the they idea think, that we know better than everybody oh, God else. God is going to take them it. to heaven before yes. everybody else just because they know grammar really well. Religion is <laughs> not as simple as that. <laughs> and very often it's the great scholars who are going to be taken to task because so many people's guidance is dependent on their mediation of the religion. They're carrying a big burden. Uh, but yes, there has to be an elite. And sometimes because of the nature of mass media and social media nowadays, everything becomes dumbed down. And the masses look at a few YouTube clips and think that they know the correct Islamic law rules for divorce, for instance, and they don't need to bother with the books of fiqh and with the ulama. And as a result, the coherence and the unity of, of, of classical Islam is starting to break apart because everybody's become their own mufti. Mm. They Google things, they look things up, and inevitably what they end up choosing is the thing that they're most comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is a subversion of the traditional thing. The alim may give you a ruling that you're not very comfortable with, but that's the correct interpretation. Or he may give you something that actually sounds really easy, and your ego craves something really difficult and tough, but that also is the correct ruling. So uh, the internet is a very, very poor replacement for, for the ulama. I was just going to ask you And it you does about dumb that. us down and makes us look at whoever's shouting loudest, whoever has the most interesting beard, or whoever's got the most likes, which has nothing to do with a sharia judgment, but unfortunately yeah. this is where a lot of young people look for authenticity. Is this, do you think, um, in part, it explains the extremism in the Muslim world or um, extremist groups? Do you think this is the reason? Do you think the ulama are not doing enough? Or do you think that it's just the internet, the power of the internet, um, where they get their answers well, from? Well, extremism, which is what historically the ulama referred to as ghulu, um, which is uh, you know, referred to and denounced by the Holy Prophet himself, alayhi salatu uh, The people who became the Khawarij were kind of active in his lifetime. Uh, that it is usually the phenomenon of the semi-educated. Mm -hmm. So the people who rebelled against many of the great ones in early Islam, uh, they, they were tribesmen from Central Arabia, they were recent Muslims, Jahiliya was very... Uh, recent in, in their memories. 
Uh, and really down the centuries in Islamic history, you find that people with very extreme uh, views who don't want to listen to the ulama or debate with the ulama, but just to start killing people. Uh, it, it tends to be people who are very superficially educated. In the Ottoman Empire, for instance, they had uh, movements like the Kuzelbash, for instance. Right. Uh, the Kuzelbash were a very dangerous phenomenon for the Ottoman Empire in the 15th and 16th century. But they were these illiterate Turkish nomads with flocks of sheep, with very weird religious ideas, um, who the ulama regarded with horror. And this is happening nowadays, as young people are detached from respect from the ulama, or may not know who the great ulama are. Alhamdulillah, we still have them, but some people may be detached from them for, yes. for whatever reason. That uh, instead of accepting what the scholars say, which may be a bitter pill, they may say, just, just be patient. Um, they follow whatever interpretation seems to speak to their inner anxieties, to their desire for revenge, to their sense of hurt, to childhood traumas, to addiction issues that they mm. might have had. It's certain broken individuals who are very often inclined to acts that are intrinsically repulsive. Yes. Islam is the religion of Rahmah, and the Holy Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent us a mercy to the world. But if people have not been shown much mercy, especially in early childhood, or they've been badly treated in the criminal justice system, or somebody has been bombing them for reasons they don't understand, or they're broken in some way, their natural fitra may be broken and they may incline towards something that, instead of being the most beautiful interpretation of religion, ends up making religion something ugly. Now we have this principle called istihsan, in, 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 in usul al-fiqh, in Islamic jurisprudence, which is a way in which where there's different rulings and the possibility exists that a certain analogy may lead to hardship for people, you follow through istihsan that which leads to the more beautiful outcome, <laughs> even if it seems rather difficult to justify on the basis of a literal interpretation of the text. And most of the, the, the schools of the jurists accept this. What we seem to have nowadays is istiqbah, as I call it. <laughs> it's the opposite. People see two possible fatwas, and because they're so full of issues, their hearts are full of thorns, they've been beaten by their parents, or somebody has done something horrible to them, or whatever, that their instinct is to assume that whatever is ugliest is the most authentic. And that's death for religion. The Holy Prophet was beautiful. People used to love just looking at him. His message was experiences of beauty and rain in the desert. But if you turn religion into a mirror for your own ugliness and tell the world, Islam is as ugly as I am, then you're going to undo, undo the work of the prophets and drive people away from, from, from the sunnah and the way of the Holy Prophet And unfortunately, the people who are doing most damage now to the honor of our religion are some of the Muslims themselves whose anger has overcome the natural Muslim desire for beauty and mercy and inclines them to fatwas that are so strange and so brutal that you can hardly find them anywhere in the oceanic libraries of classical Islamic civilization. And this is a deep subversion because it, it damages Iman in people's hearts and drives people away from religion. Exactly that point in human history where people are so confused and so weak, they need more religion more now than ever. Yeah. These people are making it very hard for people to approach Allah's religion because of their angry faces, their narrow-mindedness, their, uh, their option for whatever seems to be ugliest and most repellent. And they will be harshly judged, I think, by by the Lord of the Worlds for driving people away from Allah's beautiful religion. I think they will have a difficult hisab. Sheikh, uh, what are your immediate um, ventures and uh, mm -hmm. things that you're going to be doing, inshallah? What's, what's your latest project? Well, the big uh, headache for the Muslims in Cambridge at the moment uh, is, of course, our plan to create the first purpose-built mosque in Cambridge. Yeah. And, of course, we're a city with an ancient rivalry with Oxford, <laughs> Oxford. the only way in which it outstrips Cambridge is that it has four purpose-built mosques. Yes. We haven't got one. Oh, no. And even though there's thousands of Muslims living in Cambridge and people come to study there from all over the world, including some rather special people who go on to make a difference in, in their own Muslim countries, it's a bit of a shame that we don't have a proper masjid and people are praying in former chapels and, and, and warehouses. Uh, Islam really needs to be honored by taking its place on the urban skyline. Uh, something that really stands out. So we have this design for quite a landmark building now. We've bought the land, we've got planning permission, and Wonderful. the big yellow machines are actually moving around now on the site, and we're digging the Wonderful. basement. So it's actually fully under construction now. Um, so Is it a traditional design? 
It would depend what you mean by a traditional design. Well, um, like Hassan Fathi kind of no, because traditional Islamic, or it's the, more relevant for the for the for Cambridge for, the, for the UK. It, it's easy in an Arab country or in Iran or Turkey or Bosnia or Spain to create a traditional Islamic design because there's a local indigenous tradition. Yes. But what is the local indigenous English tradition of mosque design? Yeah, this is a very interesting topic. You have to create something topic. that might look a bit like a church or something Gothic. And yes. even though modern British building has left that behind anyway. So rather than trying to do something rather artificial and mannered, uh, we opted for a design that has uh, a modernist uh, feel to it, but also relates to some of the Gothic fig- uh, features of Cambridge architecture, like the fan vaulting in King's College Chapel, and also some of the Central Asian traditions of white brick construction. So the brick on the outside of the building is actually patterned and has Quranic verses written in what's called the Shatranj school of Islamic calligraphy and the, the brickwork. So the Irish bricklayers are having a bit of, uh, <laughs> bit of a hard time with it because they can't make any mistakes and it's difficult to correct afterwards. But yeah, there'll be qulhu allahu ahad and so forth all over the external of the building on this, this brickwork. So it will be a landmark building. How can we, British Muslims, support it and how can the wider community, whoever's watching, well, Muslims support all over, it? Muslims all over Britain have been very helpful and, and, and supportive and we've had um, uh, sort of awareness raising campaigns on British Muslim TV channels and so forth. And we've had even had quite a few donations from non-Muslims, which is interesting mm-hmm. and maybe unusual for a mosque because people like the design so much. Uh, I don't find it unusual. I've, I, it's probably because they, they, they have a lot of respect for you because you're... I don't think they know me from Adam, but you see on no, the, on the very... online donation page, you can see I'm an atheist and I don't know anything about religion, oh, but like here's that. my 10 pounds because I think this is going to be a beautiful thing in Cambridge. So we've had dozens and dozens of things like that. So it's not the Muslims kind of competing with everybody else. The whole community, Muslim and non-Muslim, is kind of keen to see this going ahead. So when we went through the planning permission process, which is sometimes a bit edgy in historical English towns because kind of you have to get permission to change the colour of your front door in Cambridge. It's, yes. it's very uh, sensitive and controlled. Yes. Every single one of the, the Cambridge city planners and the council voted for it unanimously. Uh, and the university is happy and the member of the European Parliament is happy and the bishop is happy and the Muslims are happy. So it, it, it's been an interesting social experiment in how you can get every section of the community to support something that is ultimately mainly for the Muslims. Uh, And actually very reassuring because it shows that Islamophobia exists, but it's not the norm in Britain yet. And most people are really little old ladies writing in with their five pounds, suggesting what kind of trees we could plant outside. The whole community really excited by it. Do you think that's because of the Queen, the fact that it's a constitutional monarchy and England, the UK is still Probably we can call it, it's probably more religious than the rest of the countries in Europe. It may have something to do with that, uh, but Cambridge is a bit of a bubble anyway. Cambridge Mm -hmm. has a large number of very cosmopolitan, international, educated people who understand that the city's prosperity depends on it being an international city, bringing in foreign students, and of course it has to have a mosque. Uh, in some parts of the country where they have more UKIP voters, perhaps, or BNP voters, there's a lot of vociferous opposition to mosques. But I think if the mosque committees Uh, liaise properly with local communities and explain, look, there's something in this for you as well because we're going to put a garden at the front or there's a hall that you can hire and it's going to look nice and actually try and listen to what local residents want, which is what we did before we even chose the design. You can actually bring them on board quite quickly and uh, most anti-Muslim prejudice is uh, a very superficial eggshell based on what people have seen on the nine o'clock news the night before. It's not a very deep-rooted, visceral thing. And you can break through it very quickly just by inviting people in for a cup of tea and showing them the mosque and saying, this is what we're doing. And we also believe in God and we're going to be helping refugees and asylum seekers and the homeless and you know, we're part of the community. Yeah. And um, 90% of people in Britain can be won over very, very quickly. Yes, It's been quite reassuring, actually, to see how much positivity there is. Sheikh, I'd like to ask you two more questions, if you'd allow me. The first one is... Do you believe that it's possible to have a unique, uniquely Islamic, traditional Islamic, authentic Islamic Mm -hmm. American culture or British Islam? Mm -hmm. Um, Is that possible? I mean, when I see you, an Englishman, very at peace with his English roots, but you're a Muslim at the same time and there's no contradiction at all. But I'd like to get your take on it. Well, whenever we talk about 
the essence rather than superficial features of a culture. We're dealing with something very hard to pin down. So everybody might say, well, Britishness means wearing a duffel coat and smoking a briar pipe and liking fish and chips and warm beer. And uh, that doesn't get to the essence of the thing. Right. Uh, it's part of Allah's wisdom in creating diversity. The difference of your uh, languages and your colors, nowadays would say it's to do with culture, uh, is one of God's signs. Yes. And part of the majesty of his creation is that there's so much of it. And human beings, who as descendants of Adam, are the most majestic thing about creation, potentially more beauty, more ethics, more extraordinary creativity amongst human beings than in anything else, or the rest of the world put together, uh, that this is also a sphere of diversity, and this is part of the beauty of Islam, yes. which it is, is that it historically spread over this unprecedentedly huge chunk of the Earth's surface, and not homogenized everybody. Mm -hmm. They didn't all suddenly become Arabs. Yes. But one of the miracles of Islam is that, for instance, when it went to the Persian cultural zone, the Turkish cultural zone, Uzbek, the local literature actually was revived and burst into life, as if Islam was kind of the rain that made the flowers grow. Iranian literature, before Islam, was a few dusty legends about kings and a few inscriptions and deadly dull. Islam comes, ostensibly from somewhere not Persian, and then Saudi you have the miracle office, of yes. the world's greatest ever religious literature. Yes. The same for the Turks, the same for everywhere, Malay. Yes. Islam has this tremendous capacity to bring everybody into the same Ummah, so everybody's facing the same Kaaba and fasting the same Ramadan and going on the same Hajj, more united in its basic forms than any other religion, without exception, but also allowing this flourishing of these different cultures. And you can see that that is not some kind of Arab imperialism, so everybody becomes Abu this and wears a cotton thobe and pretends that he's in the desert, even if he's in Alaska and it's raining. It's not yes. that. It's about a uh, creative adaptation while keeping the core, the essence of the prophetic mission, absolutely intact. So that's what we've done historically, spread and fertilize cultures while bringing everybody to the Qibla. So then the question is, what happens when you reach the post-traditional world, yes. like Britain or LA or yes. Cape Town? Does the same process happen? Well, given the logic of our civilization, it has to happen. Why should a British Muslim become a Turkish Muslim? or an Arab Muslim, or a Pakistani Muslim. There's no Sharia requirement for that. Um, we're not all gonna start eating Arab food and speaking Arabic, and yes. uh, it's not, not required. Nobody expects it to be required, except for a kind of tiny 0.1% of people who understand Islam as being that, but that's not the Olama's position. So what happens when Islamic civilization, which historically transformed, other places that also had a strong religious and a sacred dimension, yes. when it moves into a secular space, can it achieve the same miracle? And this is, this is tied into my second yeah. question, so you, you're answering yeah. it. Yes. So if we are saying it's part of our authenticity that we have a local as well as universal dimension, so that there's Turkish Islam, there's Bosnian Islam, there's Russian Islam, blah, blah, blah millions of Islams with yes. the same qibla, what does a British Islam look like yes. when we're all new and we don't have a history of British Muslim literature or how do we dress, how do we build mosques, everything is new. Well, of course, everything was new for the Turks once, everything was new for the Malays once, they had to start somewhere. But the real catch is that the local, the British, is also extremely degenerated. In other words, the English people no longer know the songs of their ancestors. Mm. They no longer dress in a specifically British way. Even 50 years ago, you could tell a British car in the street, it looked mm. quite different from the Renault and the Citroen. Now it's all the same. Everybody's homes are globalized. Everybody's listening to the latest international music. So at a time when the religion is requiring us to find the orf and the ada in Sharia terms for uh, creating a successful Muslim habitat in Britain, the local orf and ada is being vaporized and destroyed. And everybody's really anxious, which is why you have these nationalisms popping up now and Le Pen in France and yes. the, the, the whole thing. Everybody's aware that the national identity is being confiscated. And so they find the soft target and they blame the immigrants. Yes. It wasn't the immigrants that caused the local culture to decline. It was the local people deciding to become Americanized and globalized, but they're the scapegoats. So what do we do in the context of modern Britain? Well, one thing I'd like to see us starting to do is to become archeologists. In other words, what happens if we do some digging and find out 
what are the local songs and the local sounds and what's the Celtic tradition like and, and what you're remains. Doing that. You're doing that. So this is my experiment. Yes. I'm certainly not saying that every British Muslim should suddenly start singing as if he was from kind of the Watersons or some folk group. It's just yes. kind of an experiment to show the world the universalism of Islam. And the Islamophobes... Forgive me, what's the name of that book that you did that I should know it? It's the... the Common, British, uh, uh, songs of, M- Muslim Songs of the British Isles. Muslim Songs of the British Isles. And it's, it's available book, it's on, book on that iTunes, published. it's available on it's, Amazon. It's, it's not on iTunes because it's not audio. It's uh, just... There's a, there's a British Muslim... It's like this, a song book there's a British lyrics Mus- and, and... There's a British Muslim song, song uh, website yeah. and there's also the book which we're trying to get into schools and so forth. And it is exactly the thing that the Islamophobes think is impossible. Because their view is that Islam is something foreign. These are immigrants who fell off a banana boat. They can't relate to anything that we've got. If you show that Islam is actually capable of inhabiting this heartland of their own cultural identity, uh, then they're dumbstruck because they think that's exactly what Muslims can't be. And there's some Muslims who also think we should only sing in Arabic or do or do songs or whatever, but that's not a Sharia argument. So it's a very interesting experiment to see how the two worlds can be brought together and overlap and mutually reinforce each other. And the, the Celtic style in particular, the English folk is a little bit flat compared to what the Celtic fringe can produce. Yes. The Hebridean music, the the, I'm a the, lover of the this Irish. Sound. There's, there's a deep spirit there. Oh, right so, yeah, we've even experienced, uh, experimented with some Tejweed modes, for instance, using, using the Celtic uh, maqams, using all the rules of Tejweed. It's entirely Sharia compliant, but the sound is not Middle Eastern, it's a kind of Celtic fringe sound, and shows that if there's going to be a British Islam, it's going to be a thousand times more deep and regenerative for, any, for everybody than the nonsense that the government has in mind, which is that it's just about everybody signing up to a package of liberal social beliefs and... Uh, the British government doesn't really know what Britishness, British identity is or British values are any longer because they've also bought into the globalised world of everything being vaporised and and turned into what Charles Taylor calls the felt flatness of modernity. But the Muslims, because we like to see what's deep and what's beautiful and what's lasting, we can actually get down to that stratum more easily than the government can. So we can be, in an authentic sense, more British while remaining Sharia compliant than anybody in Whitehall. Wow, and that's what nobody that. thinks could ever happen. So wow. it's quite an exciting project. Sheikh, that's so moving. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I learned a lot. I always mm-hmm. learn a lot from you. Sheikh, could you kindly uh, end the program by sharing a few words for reflection? I think that one of the things that has to unite us, because it's prophetic teaching, is the, the primacy of mercy. Holy Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "Irhamu uh, man fil ardi, irhamu kum man fil sama." Have mercy on those who are on the earth, which is a big category, including the animals and the mountains yes. and uh, forests and everything, the ice caps, and the one who is in heaven will have mercy on you. We are in danger nowadays, as Benny Adam of not meriting that divine mercy. And there are signs of divine displeasure, even though Allah is sabur with Bani Adam, and we need to be aware of that, because if he's angry, we know he can chastise humanity. We know what happened to Nuh and to the, 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 the peoples of old. He, he can chastise. Sari yes. al-Iqab, we need to remember and be fearful of that. Human beings are not showing mutual mercy now. They don't see the miracle of the ruh in every other human being. They don't see the wonder of the divine creation and the miracle of consciousness and ethical life and beauty. And they don't see the wonder of it. Even though the Qur'an is telling us that the world is amazing and wonderful, we just see how we can manipulate people, how we can get money out of this, how we can feel good about ourselves, all these superficial animal things. That's a great tragedy. If we continue to do that, thinking about ourselves rather than looking at the wonder of other people and contemplating their rights, um, the danger is that the divine anger will become truly manifest against the people of this age when the only thing that will save us will be Allah's mercy and, and, and the power of prayer. So we have to be careful when we step back from this prophetic commandment of showing mercy to each other. Ar-Rahimun, Yarhamuhum Ar-Rahman. Those who show mercy, the merciful one will show mercy upon them. So we ask Allah to make us amongst them.